Perhaps just one or two very quick questions, because I actually want to, uh, Terry. <laughs> so I, I remember, uh, okay, we'll, we'll, you know the rules. Uh, Terry Sienowski, I, I uh, had the privilege of working with John Wheeler over 30 years ago, and I remember him saying way back then, it from bit. Right. And his little, he likes his little slogans. Uh, it from it bit. From bit. It from bit. That the uh, that the uh, it the universe particles come out of piece of information of a program as you say running on a computer. But it seems to me that that just, re just replaces the turtle with the computer. <laughs> well, I showed the sort of turtle loop, and I think you're quite right. If all all you want to do is to put make information primary and matter, uh, then come from it. Uh, if I'd had a longer talk, I would have showed a slide of precisely that. You know, in the conventional way, you've got mathematics at the bottom laws of physics, then you've got matter, then you've got information, then you've got understanding, you know, in a sort of great chain of being. Um, and, and just flipping over the, the bottom ones doesn't really get you there. What you need to do is to, and in fact, well, it's, it was up there, it's, it's a self-synthesizing loop where uh, each of these things supports the other. I showed the turtle loop briefly. So that's what I'm after. Now, of course, people still say, well, that doesn't, you know, it's still not an ultimate explanation for existence, because even if everything explains everything else in this uh, loopy manner, uh, you, could, you could still say, well, why that particular loop? Why does that exist rather than some other self-consistent loop? Well, it could be that all self-consistent loops are out there somewhere, and this is just one of them. Uh, but uh, I think that's better than just sort of having the Tower of Turtles and a levitating super turtle on, and just declaring that's it. Because we will never, ever resolve these issues about I prefer a transcendent god, I, you know, I prefer mind at the bottom, I prefer... Mathematics at the bottom, I prefer super string Lagrangian. How are we ever going to resolve that? Uh, Paul Churchland, Professor Davies. Uh, there is a possibility within the neighborhood of possibilities you've scouted in your talk that you didn't mention, and I'd like your comment on it. Uh, one, uh, let me give, start with an, anal an analogy. Uh, young children often think that there's only a finite number of numbers and there is a biggest number and they're rather shocked to learn that there isn't one. Right. And uh, one might say the same thing about the sequence of theories that uh, uh, intellectual communities produce over time. Our theories get deeper and more accurate and more penetrating and each explains to some degree the success of its uh, precursor and so forth. And so here we're looking at a stack of, of theories and there is a possibility that uh, the question how do we explain the fundamental theory, supposing there is one? Uh, th that question could be answered, well, you're assuming that there is one. Perhaps right. theories just get uh, more and more and more successful. It's turtles all the way down. Ad infinitum. But the turtles change. The turtles change. They're, they're not identical turtles. And uh, I'm, I'm here suggesting that theories are, after all, creations of cognitive creatures uh, made in an attempt to understand the universe around them. And and if the universe is, as it may be, infinitely complex, and any uh, machine inside it will be finitely complex, then any such creature, such as ourselves, are doomed to have at most a partial understanding of what's going on, right. and that will endure forever, even though we'll get a better and better and better grasp. Yes, I hope, I hope you're wrong, and of course it's, uh, it is often said that all we're doing is just making successive approximations to you know, the truth or something that's out there. Um, or just building better and better models of, of reality. Um, and uh, again, you know, Stephen Hawking did a, a, one of his famous U-turns on this very issue, because if one appeals to Gödel's incompleteness theorem, there's a very deep sense in which you can never know that you've got the last word on the subject. Um, now, some people like Freeman Dyson draw inspiration from that. There'll always be mystery. See, some people like the mystery. I, I've never liked that. That's just purely a, a personal thing. I like to feel yes, we can grasp this if we only put enough effort into it. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm motivated by the thought that there is an answer out there and that using scientific methods of inquiry, we can maybe get to what it is. But I have to concede that it may, may just be a mirage. Maybe we're just, just chasing after something that simply doesn't exist. Or maybe, and the, the, the point I, the, the last paragraph of the book, I make the point that uh, and, and it was implicit in what you said, that our, our minds have evolved to solve certain problems. And we set up problems. The, the, the conceptual framework we use to discuss these sorts of things at this meeting uh, in terms of cause and effect and, you know, gods and laws and mathematics and 
scientific method and so on. All of these things we've inherited from evolutionary happenstance. Uh, and it could be that now we can transcend these human limitations through artificial intelligence and building machines that can engage in intellectual, one day, engage in intellectual inquiry that would be completely uh, uh, beyond us. And these would not be restricted by biological evolution to certain patterns of thought. Maybe they'll crack the problem, but maybe it will be completely incomprehensible to us because we simply can't put it into the language, into the conceptual framework that we've inherited from biology. Yeah, just one more before we move on, Lawrence Krauss. Um, two comments, Paul. One, um, just to put in perspective, I'm not sure that Stephen Hawking's picture of, of uh, being able to limit what you can say about the past based on your observation of the present is really um, accepted as broadly as, as, as you might suggest. I think there are people who have big problems with that still. But well, well, not, you, you mean other people have problems with Stephen's uh, oh, interpretation uh, of that? I think yeah, that's right. uh, yeah. but, uh, but on the question you gave, and it's <coughs> uh, again, um, it's a little technical, so I won't waste a lot of time here. But uh, as you know, I've thought a lot about computing in the future, and and um, uh, the, this 122 bits worries me a little bit because it's kind of observer dependent. It, it's not. It's the it's the computational power of, of, of a universe patch. within the context yeah. of any given observer. Right. And that, so the, the question to me of whether the universe is limited by a single observer is, or it, it seems to me questionable first. And secondly, um, the, the, the question of, uh, of 400 entangled particles, whether, um, I think the, the question of whether that's going to use up all the bits in the universe, it depends upon, it, it can, it can compute without, as long as it doesn't process that many bits, I don't see any, any problem. Right, if you're a Platonist, it doesn't matter because it's computing in this platonic heaven and it doesn't Well, no, no, but I mean it doesn't, the quantum, the, the quantum evolution I think can be completely unitary as long as it doesn't process bits. But the, but ah. the more important question is the fact that I, I think this limitation of the universe based on an observer is something I would worry about. You don't like that, right, yeah. right. Well, it, and of course I, it'll appear mysterious to many people here is that as to why it's finite, and it has to do with the finite speed of light and age of the universe yeah. and so on, and so it does, it does get... But the exact actual universe point. itself is far bigger than the horizon of an individual uh, uh, Yeah. so uh, therefore uh, it's not absolutely. as limited. So it's, it's causally disconnected patches, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, so you have, to, you have to buy that that is a significant, fundamentally significant. And that really is a matter of judgment, as to whether you think something like the holographic principle, as say Lenny Susskind would, it really gets to the heart of what nature is about, or whether it's a sort of little technical extra. So perhaps the two of you could get some paper and pen out and break and sort that one out. It'd be very, very easy. Um, um, so do uh, I just sit there? Yeah, I think just sit and, and we'll wait for Stephen Adler and then we'll have a conversation right. afterwards. And whoever's got the plaintively chirping cell phone, would they please attend to it as well? <laughs> um, one of the things that we'd like to get onto later when, when Steve joins us and the other people join us is, is that <clears throat> obviously there, there is some connection here between the kind of universe you're talking about. You're talking, you, you mentioned briefly Einstein, Podolsky, Rose and so on, quantum entanglement and so on. Right. Which leads us on to John Stuart Bell and all those mm -hmm. sorts of things. And the notion of a, uh, a John Stuart Bell universe is, has some correlation with a Spinozistic universe, in my view anyway. Right. And to, to discuss that properly, I think we need to hear about Spinoza. Right who is often invoked by Einstein and was invoked by Carl Sagan and when they were asked who was, what kind of a, which god did they believe in, they, or they, they said Spinoza's god. So um, I thought it would be useful, I thought it'd be useful at this point to have the chair of philosophy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Steve Nadler, whose um, life of Spinoza, um, I commend you for this ex excellent reading. So this is Steve Nadler. 